I now wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce somebody very special, our, our second keynote speaker this morning, uh, Mrs. Toyen Saraki, um, a global champion in her own right. Uh, somebody passionate about the work of development. Her and I met, I think, around 2011, and we decided that we had a common vision, and we've been trying to see how we can do our part to celebrate indigenous leadership and to make sure that we do our part in advancing uh, this field. Um, Toyang is known in the global health community for the passion she has for women and children. Uh, she was recently named Goodwill Ambassador for ICM, the International Council of Midwives. And I can tell you she wakes up every morning thinking about how to improve the status of women. I'd like to invite Toyang to come to the stage and address us. Toyang Saraki. Hi everybody, good morning. Good morning to Switchpoint and good morning to Saxapaha. I'm really excited to be here with you and I want to say a big thank you to Papa Gay and IntraHealth for inviting me to what I discovered, you know, when I got here is the research triangle of America. Apparently this area has more PhDs in it densely populated space than anywhere else in America. I'm here today to talk to you about how we ensure health and well-being for every woman and every child and every hour. And when we say every woman, you know, what do we really mean by every woman? I wanted to start by telling you my own story, why I came to work in women and children's health, because I'm probably the most unlikely medic. I'm actually somebody who used to faint in biology classes when they showed us blood. And I very quickly actually gave up biology and did physics instead. But when I was 25, I was getting married and I was preparing for my wedding and I was pregnant. And I was pregnant with twins. And um, in our culture, you don't really give children a name until you have them. And I didn't really understand that culture very well, so I had given them names in my heart. I think I called one Ramon and the other one Simone or something like that. But the night before my wedding, I went into premature labor. I had a very big problem. I was rushed to hospital in my country, the best hospital, actually, in Lagos. And we couldn't solve the problem. So I had one, very premature, 28 weeks, taken straight to an incubator, and I lost one. And in the next 24 hours, I saw the entirety of my country's health system from a private sector perspective, but it was the health system nonetheless. I couldn't breastfeed and I was given a white bowl. The baby needed blood and I had to bring all my family members in to try to see whose blood would be a match. There wasn't a blood bank that we could use or trust. Um, the baby had a hole in the heart and I was lucky the doctors that my parents had flown in were actually researching pediatric digoxin then, so the hole in the heart closed. But about a week after, and we were still, you know, the doctors were doing their best and struggling to save my life. About a week after, a baby was born in that area, and the father brought the baby into the hospital. And they were going to turn them away because they didn't have money to pay. And I just, in my promises to God, I had been saying, you know, if you just save my child, I will help other people. So I told them, please look after this child and I will pay for the bill. And the child survived and so did mine. But 
it got me thinking that if me, with all my resources, had such a struggle to live and still lost one, what about the people that have nothing? And that's when I started to work. It was really very simple, just keeping my promise. If somebody had a baby and they couldn't pay or they needed to pay for a cesarean, I would pay for it. And in my country, because we don't really have universal health coverage yet, if the hospital gives you treatment and you can't pay, they detain you in the hospital until you can pay. So usually what happens is other members of the family start going to their church, to their mosque, to any wealthier relations to beg for money to pay for this treatment. And over the years, I just thought it was unfair. And I was quite well traveled. I went to other countries. I saw countries where health is your right and you are educated to exercise that right. And I still could not gain the impact I wanted to gain. I wanted to make sure that every pregnant woman knows what to expect when she's pregnant, knows where to get the treatment, and has a good quality of that treatment. And I was trying, and no offense to any doctors in the room, I was trying to work with doctors, and they kept telling me all the challenges and not how to get around those challenges until I met midwives. I mean, we've all known midwives all our lives, when any of us who has had a child has had a midwife. But it's funny, you don't usually know your midwife's name. You know your doctor's name, and you don't know your midwife's name, even though she's the one that's with you. And I suddenly said, what if I work with midwives? So I approached the International Confederation of Midwives, and they were very kind, actually. They made me their global ambassador, which gave me access now to over 600,000 midwives in 136 countries. But back to my own country in Nigeria. In 2004, when I started my foundation, our death rate was one in six in pregnancy. One in every six Nigerian women died in childbirth or the first hour after childbirth, or a week later, or lived with permanent birth injury. And I felt we had to stop this. I first started by creating health records to actually check and track everything that happened to a pregnant woman during her pregnancy. And I had a lot of pushback because our people did not want to be accountable. This is 14 years ago. They didn't want anybody to know the name of the doctor who was with the woman, and they didn't even want us to know the why the woman died. They just wanted to measure how many women gave birth and how many women died. But I knew the reasons why the women were dying. Postpartum hemorrhage, sepsis, sometimes a simple urinary tract infection, malaria in pregnancy, these are basic, basic, and to a certain extent, preeclampsia, which is very strange because we're now tying that to cooking with fossil fuels indoors. But the question still remained, how can I get to scale? How can I save these women? And then I came across a very simple idea. I said, why don't I give them lessons when they're pregnant? So I started initially with three midwives. Now we have 73. And I started by sending them to three medical centers in three towns just to give free lessons to pregnant women. And we were using anatomical models. Today, we have 576 locations in four states. And we're reaching 8,000 women a month. And the crazy thing about it is that none of what I call my mama care moms has died even though they may be having lessons in an area where the death rate is 1 in 12 or 1 in 13, none of mine have died. And that just tells me that the mother's education, what she knows, and her expectation of a decent standard is actually what is making her an equal partner in the battle to keep her alive. And then I looked at basic things. We have very bad wash conditions currently in Nigeria. Only 22% of health facilities actually have running water and soap, and only 12% of those have that in the labor room. And then we have a culture that when we have a baby, we want to give that baby a drink of water. That culture is what is killing 
our children. Because that drink of water, if it's a drink of dirty water, that child gets diarrhea within the first day and that child goes. And you might think it's crazy, but between myself and my partners, Family Health International, we are spending, um, I think, $1.4 million dollars in teaching women how to breastfeed. And it's not just because we're bonding them with their baby. And it's not just because of the nutrition aspect. It's actually to keep the dirty water away from the newborn baby. We use four different methods to get women to breastfeed. And our breastfeeding rates in Nigeria are very low, only 35% of Nigerians breastfeed, whereas we all know that mother's own milk is the best nutrition you can give a newborn baby. And actually, if you have a sick baby in a preterm condition, in a NICU, you actually need to give that child colostrum. Colostrum, administered bookily, it's like medicine. We're trying to reach 40,000 women with this training on how to breastfeed and to also make their families support them in breastfeeding. And then we look at safe surgery. We started a new program three years ago. It's the emergency management of maternal and newborn care. We use anatomical models to teach doctors, nurses, midwives who are already in the field for quality improvement, the best way to do the procedures they were supposedly trained to do. The results have been amazing. A 15% increase in survival, and in some areas, a 35% decrease in stillbirths. And you might wonder, why are we using models? But some of these doctors and nurses are telling me, this is the first time I have known how to evacuate a placenta properly. And then I want to share with you two stories, because I had a long journey to come here. I think I had 15 hours of flying, but I felt it was worth it because they said research triangle. And I thought to get the right woman, the right treatment, the right quality, the right resources, at the right time, in the right place, I have to come to this place that they call as the research triangle. And I read in the newspapers, um, one of my countrywomen was having sex duplets, and she got on a plane and she came to America. And a lot of people at home thought she was doing this health tourism. But I knew she was not doing health tourism. I knew she made that trip in that condition because she wanted to save her life and the life of her children. And she knew she was coming to a place that had the right resources at the right time. All she needed to bring was herself the right woman. And people say, oh, it's health tourism, oh, it's costing so much, but you know, it costs more than money. And then I will share with you another story. Last week in the newspapers in Nigeria, I read that a woman in prison had twins. And as I was reading it, my heart sank, but I was hoping for the best because the state where she had the twins, they were jubilating. Oh, we have delivered safely a set of twins in X, Y, and Z prison. And I just very quietly kept myself to myself. And in my mind, I was thinking, my God, I hope they evacuated the placentas properly. And of course, four days later, I'm checking because a woman in prison is at the mercy of the state. I actually think that's the most accurate snapshot of a country's public health system because she will not have any rights to exercise while she's in prison. So whatever happens to her is what the nation does to every woman and every child if that woman is helpless and can't do it for herself. I checked on her yesterday and she was already dead. And that, for me, really tells me that even though we are seeing pockets of excellence, even though we are seeing universal health coverage coming, even though we have a plan to put primary health care centers across Nigeria, we have to. It's imperative. There is an urgency. I keep telling my moms that family planning is not abortion. Family planning is being able to choose 
when you want to have your child, for every child to be wanted, every child to be loved, for every woman to be able to be afforded to access the quality of care that she needs to bring that child into the world with a proper, decent education and information, to be respected when she presents herself in the hospital, and for care providers to be able to give that care to a good quality that's available to all. I have never wanted to have anything to do with a health chain that looks like medicine for the poor. I don't think that that is what human rights are about. I think human rights are to know that even the lowest level is good enough for any of us to walk in, have our life saved, and hopefully one day in Africa we will begin to move towards the kind of medicine that we are getting up happily in our houses to access medicine to keep well not always just in an emergency situation and hoping and praying that we're not gonna die. When I was in hospital, my grandmother came to stay. She arrived with a pile of 10 Bibles and she told me to pray. And I did pray and God was on my side. But I'd like to think that by the time I finish my work, and I hope I will finish my work, I hope that women in my country will be able to pray but will also have the right resources to be able to say, I'm every woman and I got some decent care and dignity for myself. I want to thank you very much for listening. I'm very grateful to be here. And I hope that I will go back with some of that research that's gonna help me to get the resources to my people. Thank you. Thank you very much.